Okay, on the stage, we have Kevin Martin. Thank you for joining me. And we seem to be talking a lot about change today, and that's not going to change uh, with your talk, I don't think. And it's about leading in a world of continuous disruption and reimagining our talent supply chain. So welcome. So glad that you're here and take it away. Thanks, Tina. I just want to confirm, can you see and hear me and also see the beginning slide? I sure can, and hopefully everyone else can too. If you have any issues or questions, type them in the chat and I'll be taking a look. Nancy says That's yes. That's not a good sign. So we are good. Hold on. Hey, Tina? Yes, I can okay. hear you, I can see you. Okay, great. I had a dual monitor going on, and uh, which to me means one monitor too many for, for my <laughs> tiny brain. So, all right. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And and I'll tell you, I it was really interesting listening in on Katie's presentation. Um, you know, the the insight early on into how people would say how people perceive their role in the organization around order taker, administrator, trainer, tentative, um, and you know, it's it's. Uh, that really speaks to you know the panel discussion that that uh, that we had early on and some of the points that I was trying to allude to there and hopefully uh, what we share here is going to resonate as well and so I hope Tina that you could jump in anytime you've got something that you think hey this resonates or doesn't or hey this is what we're doing at Coca Cola about it please jump right in and um, if the audience wants to jump in it would be awesome so. Yep, just raise your hand if you want to jump in and I'll put you on the stage. I appreciate that. Thanks. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with I4CP, we are a research firm. Um, our research methodology is about 15. We've been around for 40 years, but our research methodology goes back 15 years. Um, we don't study HR, even though I think we do more research in the human capital space than any firm. Well, at least that I know of. Um, we don't research HR for HR, and that includes learning learning for learning. We look at the business and we try to figure out do the practices around HR, learning, talent, culture, you know, anything to do with the people side of the equation. Do they actually have a statistical relationship to the last five years of business growth in those four outcomes? And so if you hear me talking about a high performance organization, know that in the study I'm referring to, it's the respondents who work for organizations that were in the upper quartile of companies in the last five years of business growth in those four indicators. If you hear me say low performance, it means they were in the lower quartile of those four indicators. And we're not just looking at best practices. So a best practice to us is something that distinguishes a high performance from a low performance organization. We are routinely trying to unearth what we consider next practices. And I highlighted just one in the middle here that I think really should speak to L&D professionals, which is research we've done across numerous studies has really validated the strategic role that ERGs play within an organization. ERGs meaning employee resource groups or business resource groups, uh, employee affinity groups, the old school name. Um, but basically what our research is finding is that they are excellent feeder grounds for succession and leadership criteria. And so just wanted to highlight that. And then lastly, we're not a consultancy. Uh, we're also not a technology vendor. We do research on behalf of our member organizations. And so there's about 280 organizations from large scale governments to organizations like these. And they're the ones that have exclusive access to our research and they really help drive our research agenda. Um, so if you work for one of these, thank you. We appreciate your support. Um, all right, so with that in mind, I wanna go back to you know, something that I was challenging people early on um, the today's panel discussion around, which is really being in, leading with insights. And what, what our research has clearly shown, and this is looking back over the last 15 years, is that the organizations that are best equipped to sustain high performance and to anticipate, adapt, and act on change, they really have mastered the understanding and interdependency of five core areas. And I want to, I want to give you some, some things to consider um, around these five areas in a moment, because it's really going to set up 
The second part of the presentation that I have, which is you've got to be reimagining your talent supply chain. And so the challenge I have for everyone is to think about this. And Katie was talking about change management. Change management's important. It's never going away. But the real challenge for us as leaders is to think of, not in terms of how do we manage in the change, or excuse me, manage the change that's happened. It's more of how do we manage in the change because of the continuous disruption that's happening all around us. So here's how we know, and I, I happen to co-lead a group of, of 30 chief HR officers that we convene every uh, about seven to eight weeks um, to really help them stay on the cutting edge of thinking. Um, so they're not caught off guard by their boards or their CEOs. So many of them, this really encapsulates the way that they approach the people side of the equation when uh, in order to enable their organizations to be really, really able to anticipate, adapt, and act on change. So here's what I'm getting at. The, it, it starts with markets. We have all lived in right now multiple crises, whether they are wildfires or natural disasters, whether they are the social unrest that's, that really has uh, come around from the racial inequity um, in society and in business as well, or whether it's the pandemic, we've all lived through a massive amount of external disruption. Any time that there is a change in the external landscape, and even think about the demographics of your customers, there's another great one, um, that dictates a shift in business strategy. So every business on the planet right now has changed their business strategy to some degree or another in order to adjust to the new way of working, let's say, or to um, you know, enable them to at least try to help their customers during this process or a problem, whatever it is, the crises, but there's a change in strategy. Now, this is where it really hits home with the leaders in HR and learning and talent. I'm bucketing everyone together. And that is whenever there's a shift in strategy, there are three massive derivative pieces that really hit home with us. The first is culture, and you've always got to ask, your firm has got to be on the cusp of knowing if there's a shift in strategy, like, for instance, digitization. Most companies, the pandemic has facilitated their movement to a digital business model. So when that happens, the next best, best question to ask as a firm is, what do we need to shift in our culture in order to support a new digital strategy. So for instance, you may be a firm that had more of a mechanical model. It was much more around manufacturing, um, automation, but it wasn't really, really advanced automation and digitization. You may say that before we were very process driven, we were very methodical in the way we went about things, um, and, and, and people could individually get the job done. But now, given the shift to the business, to a more digital model, you may be saying we need collaborative teamwork. And in a collaborative teamwork environment, we need a culture that is much more inclusive. We need leaders who can pull people in, not who can just get things done and get it done on time. We also need a work environment where it is much safer to take risks in certain areas versus just following the methodology that we've laid out. That's a lot of change. The reason why that clarity is so critical is because the next important piece is, is whether and how your culture needs to shift, you now have to talk about how do we lead differently? What does leadership mean? You know, leadership before could have been the smartest one in the room, made the decisions and we got things done. That no longer works anymore. The smartest one in the room, we need an inclusive environment. We need someone who is much more a collaborator, who can pull in ideas, diverse perspective, diverse experiences that really map to the customer need at hand or the business problem at hand. That's a different skill set right there. You may also say the nature of how, of what leadership is, it needs to be about what we did. What did we accomplish? Our leaders were our best performers. Well, now 
it's as much about the how of leading as it is the what of what's been accomplished or the outcomes. And so you've got to be super clear on that because as you know, as learning and talent leaders, that then dictates how you're rewarding leaders, developing leaders, bringing people into leadership positions within the companies, the types of experiences, the relationships that now need to be part of developmental and rotational programs that allow people to really get that full rounded um, uh, picture and their ability to be the leader that you need. And then of course, there's all kinds of talent derivatives. Do the pools, if, our, if, if we're moving to a digital model, and we need a different type of culture and work environment, and we need leaders who can lead differently, do the pools of talent that we pull from, are they producing what we need anymore? And if not, where do we need to pull from? What do those pools need to look like? And oh, by the way, if we need to shift what type of skills and capabilities we're pulling in, or even what our definition of worker is, you know, we need to look beyond full time and part time and into other types of mechanisms and modalities and talent pools, both internal and external. Do, does, from where we need to pull that talent, do they even know who we are? And if they do, do they view us as a great place to work? In other words, what's our brand identity? What's our employer brand? What's the perception out there? There are so many things that need to happen, but the best organizations that manage in an environment of continuous disruption are constantly thinking of this. It's about speed, speed from sensing what in the world is happening or could be happening to insight. What does that mean to us or what could it mean to action? Which of these are ones that if there are actions that we could take, given our business strategy and all the other priorities we've got going on, which of these are high level priorities we need to go forward with now? Which ones can we uh, back burner or keep in an incubator for a little bit over here? Or which ones do we not need to pursue at all? But it's, it's that type of mindset and methodology that equipped the best. And Tina, I just wanted to get your perspective you know, as a leader in, in, uh, in learning and leadership and talent, um, what does this mean to you? Or, or, you know, does this gel with the way you're thinking about things at Coca-Cola? Yeah, absolutely, Kevin. I was sitting here just nodding and smiling the whole time. The whole idea of just the process in general, the market informs the strategy, which then informs the culture and leadership and talent really resonates. We have recently rolled out a brand new culture philosophies and growth behaviors to support it. And then we went into the new leadership definitions of what does it mean to be an effective leader at the company? What does it really look like? And now we're starting to really embed that throughout the organization. So you're absolutely right. We've had to quickly pivot in areas and respond to the changes in the market to reframe our, our culture and our leadership development strategy. And, and thanks for sharing that. And that and, and I'm not surprised, you know, to hear you, uh, you know, through that as well, Tina. So many organizations are going through that. I mean, think about this. Research we did during in the middle of the pandemic. So this is in the middle of the summer. We we asked uh, it was about 350 senior level HR executives from larger organizations, meaning a thousand employees or more, and we asked them to what extent do they believe that the pandemic is changing or forcing a change in culture at their organization? And 57 percent in that particular study said to a very high extent it was doing that. And so that speaks very much to just the shift in strategy, the derivative of the culture and where things need to flow from there. So, yes. you know, I wanted to share this with everyone because not everyone gets a chance to hear from those who are charged at a public company with governing the organization. And we've had uh, one of the more significant research studies we've had underway for the past year is interviews of people who serve on public company boards. And I want to share with you a couple of snippets because, you know, what this particular board member shared with us is that, you know, the, and from her perspective, it's the ability across all organizations. She said, you know, some aren't as hampered as others, granted that, but a real dearth 
of skills is the ability within organizations to really distinguish between strong and weak signals. Now, what she's getting at here is, as I mentioned, or uh, as we're putting up here, leading with insights. Again, the only way to get to an insight is to really sense what could be happening. And you've got to be, that's key to the ability to anticipate change. And I want to share with you this. Here's another board member that we've interviewed extensively uh, over the last 12 months. She serves on three other public company boards and is, an, and is an advisor to another global 500 company. And she was, she said, you know, even just think about that from this standpoint, she said, you know, think of the fourth industrial revolution, right? And she said, I'm interested in insights of knowing where, what needs to keep our, what are we doing to keep our workforce relevant? Relevant at our firms, relevant beyond our firms, thinking of our reputation and brand. What are the strategies behind that? And how are we progressing against this? And that gets into, you know, the, the, the pieces that we were talking in the panel this morning of just the criticality of understanding what you have at its core, let alone knowing what you're going to need. And all of this, I want you to think about this. This is just a small little framework that we use um, internally and we put forth to our members is, you know, an agile mindset is one where you're constantly thinking about how do we, you know, the speed, speed from sensing what in the world is going on to insight. In other words, what does it mean to action? In other words, what are we doing about it? And I want to give you an example here, just a couple of examples. So think about this from an external sensing standpoint. You know, all of us know this. I mean, think about your firm. How many CEOs have you heard now who have said prior to the pandemic, we will never, I am not a fan of remote workers. You have to be on site to get things done here. And I'm not talking about production workers, you know, or people on the front line. I'm talking about knowledge workers. But I've heard of so many CEOs that are out there right now saying, you know what, this has proven me wrong. My team is productive. I'm concerned about you know, the family mix and what's going on personally, but I now believe my team could be more so productive at times, even not at least at the same level. So those virtual conditions are changing the mindset within companies about the, the parameters of where they can pull talent from. So that's a potential disruptor right there. Another one is think about the SEC ruling that came down at the end of August that's mandating certain human capital disclosures. Now that is, that's got serious and big time implications for public companies. Um, and for a company, I want you to even think about this. Think if your CEO has made a public statement and in saying, we are totally against the racial inequity and social injustice. We're investing this kind of money and we're gonna change things. We're gonna do better as a firm. If they're out there publicly saying it, it is not a stretch in the imagination at all that the SEC views that as material to the business. And now your investors, the SEC, are going to start thinking about how are you reporting against that? How are you showing progress against that? So there's all kinds of external disruptors. Inside, you may be saying, wow, you know what? We've moved towards a more distributed workplace. Um, that was easy. We now have 97% of the people out and we've got a hybrid model coming back. We have facilitated our digital transformation. We, you know, the skills that we had because of our move to digitization, a lot of those skills are going behind us and going forward, we're gonna need all these things. Okay, so what are the insights? I would posit that two insights that a lot of leading organizations have going through right now is that strategic workforce planning is no longer relevant. They're, they need to be thinking about strategic work planning. I'm going to talk to you about that in a moment. And that's really driven by our board member, John Bedreau, and his thinking, but we've done a lot of research with him, and it has completely validated that. Another one is that traditional talent sources may not be enough, and you've got to think elsewise. So what are the actions you're going to take? That's a good thinking methodology there. And, and I just want to share with you this. So Diane Gerson recently announced her retirement. She's now an advisor to the CEO until they name a new CHRO replacement at IBM. But when we interviewed Diane at the start of the year and said, hey, what's your big prediction for 2020? Here's what she said. This is pre-pandemic, so about two months before the pandemic. And she said, 
you know, look at her quote. She said, we need real time sense and response capabilities. In other words, the use of AI and machine learning, um, being able to pull from the knowledge bases out there, from LinkedIn profiles of our workforce, from the, from the LMSs of who's done what, the degreed systems, you name it, and telling us, this is what you have. This is where you're going based on the job descriptions you've got, or these are where you should be going based upon the external analysis that AI has done of our competitors. And this is what it means to you as a business. And she said, this is going to just absolutely blow up strategic workforce planning. And I wanted to show you just a, a graphic from, a, from the study we did with John Bedreau that we published last summer, and it was called the Human AI Interface. And this was one of the models that we put forth of really helping people to really understand how to evolve from strategic workforce to strategic work planning. And you can see I highlighted just a couple or three of these boxes here where it says, you know, as you're thinking about the work going forward, take a look at the work that you've deemed critical at your business. What are, what, or excuse me, the jobs, the job roles that are critical. Can you deconstruct those into work components? In other words, what's the actual work that needs to get done within those critical roles? In most instances of companies that we know that have done this, they have found that strategic work is just a fraction of the overall work. There's a lot of tactical work. And when, when a company is able to bifurcate it like that or disaggregate it, they can now look tactically and say, wow, is that still relevant going forward? And if so, can we automate it out? Or can we assign that to more junior level or maybe intern type talent as a way to get them to contribute early and start building a baseline capability but from a strategic work component standpoint, how can we better align people that uh, who, who within our workforce really aligns with those strategic skills we need that can do the strategic work? And how do we make more of our workforce? How can we upskill, reskill them to be much more aligned with the strategic work components going forward? And so I just wanted to show this and I wanted to stop for a minute. Tina, to see if there's any comments you have or questions from the audience at this point. Yes, this absolutely is resonating. And we are certainly on a journey as well as many other organizations. I know Suzanne is on at Bloomberg and has been on the journey for a lot longer for upskilling and reskilling the workforce and, and getting them prepared for the work of the future. I love what you said about going from strategic workforce planning to work planning. Any mm -hmm. questions? specifically from the audience. Okay, additional thoughts. I know for us, um, this whole COVID thing has accelerated our digital strategy. And what you said about certain, you know, senior leaders previously being hesitant about whether work could take place virtually, totally seeing those minds change. So that definitely hit home for me. I moved to Southern California thinking it was going to have a negative impact on my ability to continue with the company being based in Atlanta. And here we are. So I think now we don't have as many boundaries. Wonderful to see. Well, I, and we'll continue on he, uh, Tina here. And if there's other that, that may have questions, feel free to jump in. I want to, I want to make this really practical for folks. I'm not going to get into the details here. This is, one of the, this is a case study that we published here recently, but this is the start of it. I just wanted to show you how one company, Cisco, shared with us when, as part of their future of work initiative, how they're looking at strategic work planning and how that ties in to their upskilling, reskilling, and uh, how they're you know, gleaning insights. And so basically, I just wanted to show you at a very high level here that it starts with their strategy as every good in initiative does, right? Which is, what is Cisco's strategic direction? And what they're, what they're doing there is they're really trying to figure out what are the critical and core skills that are required that drives our success going forward. And so now, now with that, with that understanding, and we all know that's not an easy undertaking, but that's 
That's a approach that's really key to work with the business and understanding that. Then you've got to juxtapose that with intelligence, intelligence that you're gleaning both externally and they will use things like burning glass. They will use technology that lets them understand their primary competitors and what the, what type of skills are their are the job postings from their primary competitors calling for so that they can get an idea and say, wow, the job postings that we're listing or based on where we're going as a firm, what we're hearing from our line leaders um, or BU leaders and where we're going, how does that align with where we see our competition going? They're able to understand if they are going to, if they're aligned with that, if they're not aligned, do they anticipate that there's going to be a glut of really important skills out there that they're going to need just because of the competitive landscape and the lack of, let's say, university and other higher ed institutions to, to graduate people with that level of certification or degree needed, et cetera, et cetera. And then they look at the application piece. And this is a great area that I think is, is so, this is, this is where, you know, learning and development professionals can really add a lot of great insight, which is um, they're looking and saying, well, what roles and skills are transferable? You know, in other words, if we're going to need a lot more of blank, and one of the examples that Cisco shared with us was like UX and UI skills, the definite need for that going forward. Well, if, that, if they're going to need that going forward, are there feeder skills that fit into that? Are there other types of roles that provide baseline capability or knowledge that allows someone to do that to a certain extent where they can transfer them over or provide a career tangential or career opportunity for those individuals, or if they were to you know, apply some upskilling and reskilling in certain areas where they could take those folks who were no longer going to be relevant. Maybe it was a job role that was no longer needed at Cisco going forward, but it had these skills that were transferable skills. Now these people could be highly relevant going forward. And so this is an example of taking insights, where's our strategy going based upon the movement and opportunities in the market? What's happening from an external perspective as well as internal perspective? What does that mean for us? And how do we apply that in an actionable way going forward? I just wanted to share this because it really, I believe, takes something that can be rather ethereal and make it into something that is uh, pretty methodical and practical as well. Now, I wanted to share this, and this is, this is a really interesting conversation that, uh, that we had with Monica Poole-Knox. And she's someone from Microsoft that we asked when it came to her prediction going forward. And she was talking about the term discoverability. And we loved it because, and, and it's not just at Microsoft. We're seeing this at leading firms like Unilever. Certainly we're seeing this at IBM. We're seeing this at Schneider Electric. We're seeing this at, at real progressive firms that are using some sort of AI machine learning capability combined with skills inventory and knowledge of what type of uh, 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 knowledge and skills and capabilities and experiences that their workers have. But the real key here is, is how do we make both our people discoverable as well as enable our people to discover the next best opportunity for them that's good for them and good for the business. And so, you know, there are, there are, there are companies that are starting out, for instance, like uh, uh, creating an internal talent marketplace because they want to be able to provide job postings and other types of ways that the great talent that they've got within their enterprise can look and say, wow, I've got interest in, 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 in experiences here. I'd love to be able to leverage that versus thinking there's no opportunity here. That's a great first step. 
Where these firms are now going is saying, how do we use intelligence out there to go back to folks and saying, hey, you know what, based on your experiences, based on your capability, here's an opportunity. I'll give you an example. We, uh, we did a case study on Unilever and we highlighted their internal talent marketplace that they're calling Flex Experiences. And within Flex Experiences, their, their EVP of HR was sharing with us an example where um, at Unilever, one of their brands, I think it was an ice cream brand, um, was needing, was coming out with a, an ice cream for a market. And um, the marketplace was, they needed someone on the marketing team on that project team who had certain experience in that marketplace, but they didn't have anyone in Unilever who had in the marketing role, who had that type of experience in that marketplace. So what the system did is the system went out and analyzed the backgrounds and capabilities of the workforce and found someone in sales. By the way, it's the Hungarian market now that my memory is serving me well. They found someone in the sales organization who had experience selling into that marketplace, had, had, had experience living in that marketplace. And they went to that person and said, would you like to serve on a rotation in addition to what you're currently doing, but provide experience over here and get some experience, provide perspective back to the marketing team, but get some experience in marketing. Now, what they did not know is that this person actually had a lot of interest in marketing. And after being in that role, or not the role, but taking on that project in addition to her role, she found out that that was her real love and passion and then decided, I'm going to be this full time now and is no longer full time in sales at the firm. But that was a great way of using AI and machine learning to discover who within the organization may be able to discover their next best opportunity. And I just wanted to kind of pull that together and it and it fits this. So I had mentioned before that we're not just about best practices, we're about next practices. And a next practice that we highlighted in research back in 2015, it was research we did on talent mobility. In other words, how, how the best organizations are moving talent around the organization. And one of the things we found was that, and it wasn't a large percentage of high performance organizations, but high performance organizations were three and a half more, uh, three and a half times more likely than their lower performance counterparts to be looking at ways in which they could partner, create partnerships and other types of talent pools where they could borrow, share, exchange, rent talent. And sometimes it takes a while for a next practice to become mainstream. I'm going to tell you this, this is absolutely mainstream now. If your organizations are not looking at reinventing its talent supply chain and ecosystem, they have to, just given this new way of work, if you want to remain relevant. And what we were showing here are nine different ways that we see leading organizations really reimagining talent differently. We're not suggesting every organization is doing all nine. In fact, that'd probably be a mistake. It's way too much. You need to align with your strategy, but I just wanted to show you part of what these organizations are doing. Tina, questions or comments? Yes, great. Um, again, the internal talent marketplace is something that we've just launched into, and we're trying to get much better at an integrated talent uh, system and ecosystem. We did have a couple of questions before we wrap, because I think we just have a few minutes left. Nancy asked uh, a general question about, are the leaders that you're interacting with shell-shocked? <laughs> How are they themselves kind of responding to all of this? Hmm. Um, this meaning the pandemic and all the crises or this particular uh, all, the dis all the disruption and the change, yes. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you, this is, and I'll give you just some information. Um, we've been hosting, um, you know, just like I love what L&D Cares is about. Uh, we, we actually, when back at the end of February, we decided we were going to host weekly calls for functional leaders within HR and learning. Um, anyone could join them. And, I, um, and we host five of these a week. We have one for learning and talent leaders. I host our weekly call for CHROs and HR, senior HR leaders. And we've had thousands of people on these calls uh, over this time. And 
the HR leaders, I'm not kidding you, there, was a, there were five guests in a row. We have a CHRO. These are very prominent chief HR officers that we, ha- that we have as guests on these calls. But one of the questions that I would ask them is, is what's your advice for your peers? And I think it was four or five weeks in a row where the CHRO said, folks, and they said almost the exact same thing. Folks, our advice is this. We are in a role where we are taking care of our entire employee base. But just like what the airlines say, Brandon Carson, who's a shout out to, to, to you and Delta, just like airlines say, before you throw the oxygen mask on someone else, like your child, throw it on you first. Everyone kept saying, we have got to take care of ourselves. Everyone is uh, going, it's a very difficult time for everybody right now. And the emotional, and I want to tie this into this, Tina, sorry for, uh, my mind works as a system. I'm sorry about this, but we just got done. We've done extensive studies on workforce well-being, two in a row, pre-pandemic, in pandemic. And they have validated this. Um, career health. In other words, how good one feels about where they're at, the opportunities for them and their development has a incredibly strong statistical relationship to their overall mental and emotional health. Mm -hmm. I didn't want people to lose sight of that, but without a doubt, the onus on leaders going forward and on learning and development, our research has shown the next, that a next practice is you've got to be training your people leaders on how to identify signs of burnout, signs of mental distress, um, and so that not only are they having more empathy and just more get to know people conversation and how they're doing, but m- they can in turn make it safe for someone to say, Kevin, I'm fried. I've got so much going on here. I've got this going on here. And they can work together to try to make it better for that person. So um, long story short, everyone, everyone's experiencing the craziness. Uh, yeah, I love it. We're the whole piece about creating psychologically safe environments um, is, is really amplified right now. And we need it now more than ever to make sure our well-being is intact. I really, really appreciate the time that you spent taking us through this. This was amazing. I'm sure we'll have all the decks posted out there. Liz um, will be um, posting something for us. Is there anything else that you wanted to close out with, Kevin, before I transition us to the next activity? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, well, I skipped a couple of slides. I just want to show this. If, if the talk track to this resonated with anyone, there is an article in the Financial Times that we published uh, back in June that really speaks to this. I think it's been getting a lot of traction out there. We also have a productivity blog. I'm just giving you a snapshot of one that was written uh, back in the beginning of August. These are all free resources for people to, to leverage. If anyone has any questions, they can reach me here. Uh, but Tina, thank you. And thank you for your partnership on this. And thanks for contributing uh, to the dialogue. Of course, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. I would like to invite everyone to reach out to Kevin if you have additional questions. And then also, as we wrap up this session, feel free to take a break. But just wanted to let you know if you're in for a little bit more fun, uh, room three, I'll put the link out there. We're going to be talking about weird jobs and possibly doing some magic. So you never know what you're going to get here. Uh, And hopefully, if you have a little bit of time, you'll pop over. I put the link to room three in the chat. And as always, chat if you're having any issues. Thank you all so much, and we will see you soon. Bye, Kevin. Bye, Tina. Take care, everyone.